welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. If I were to ask you for the sweetest three-word phrase in our language, the three words which best quiet fears and quicken hope in the heart, what three words would you give me? Probably you'd say, without much hesitation, I love you. Am I right? Of course. But think again. Are there not another three words which comfort and gladden in much the same way? And are not those other three, I'm going home? Our mystery drama, The Wandering Wind, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars John Beale and Terry Keene. Our story is The Wandering Wind. We have selected it from a poem that probably few of you know. The Deva's Song by Sir Edwin Arnold. Four of the lines run like this. We are the voices of the wandering wind which moan for rest and rest can never find. Lo, as the wind is, so is mortal life. A moan a sigh, a sob, a storm, a strife. Imagine a man getting married at 63 for the first time. Especially a man like me. For I'm not even a sociable person. I'm apt to cross the street to avoid speaking to an acquaintance. If I do have to greet someone, I tend to keep my eyes on the ground and then hurry on. The truth is, human contact is simply too much for me to endure. All that I knew of life, beyond the struggle to earn a living, I got from the books I read. The philosophers and the poets. They reached me, they touched me. With them, I, I could make contact. But a living human being... Out of the question entirely. So how, you're asking, when I was entering the frosty climate of old age, did I summon the courage to marry myself to a woman that I hardly knew? And why did she choose a man like me? For it was her notion that we should marry, not mine. Are the shelves up, John? Yes, Miss Dawkins. Uh, how much do I owe you? Well, I'll leave that up to you. Whatever it's worth to you. Now, those shelves are where I keep my materials, my extra materials, remnants and things. Uh, would four dollars be all right? Well, that's all right. And uh, how much for the lumber? You had to pay for the lumber, didn't you? I want to pay you for that. How much? Oh, I got it cheap. Two thirty-five. But it's good pine. So, I owe you six dollars and thirty-five cents. Is that right? Well, if it's all right with you. You know, John, if I charge for my sewing the way you charge for carpentry... <laughs> well, yeah, there. That's six dollars. Well, I don't have the 35 cents on me. Oh, well, that's all right. No, John, that's not all right. I still owe you. Oh, some other time. No, now. I got some change in the teapot. Well, it's not too much trouble. Now you can see how much trouble it is. Now, yeah, there. There's three dimes... And a nickel. Okay. Thank you, Miss Dawkins. Don't thank me. You earned it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'll be getting along now. John, wait a minute. Sit down for a minute, can't you? Well, well I, I could... Then sit. Would you like a cup of tea? Oh, no. Thank you. You want coffee? No, no. I have to be getting on. Well, where to? Oh, uh, back to where I live. And where's that? Well, I have a, a place. What kind of place? A, a room. I better be leaving. Hey. Sit down. I said sit down, John. Please, sit down. Well? John, 
Do you like me at all? What? You don't hate me, do you? Oh, no. No. Do you maybe like me? Oh, well, I'm... I'm not asking you, do you love me? You understand that, don't you? Well, I... I... Just do you like me a little? Do you like me at all? Is that so hard to answer? I'm a little... Y- y- yes, it is hard. Why? Why is it so hard? Well, well because... Because I, I don't think about such things. Liking, loving, all that sort of thing. I, I, I just don't think about things like that. Miss Dawkins, I better go. Th- thanks for the job. Th- thanks for the money. i I, I got to get back. John, I want you to marry me. What? I want you to marry me. Is that such a terrible thing to say? You look so shocked. I'm not a frightened kind of woman, am I? Well, no. You think I'm bold, don't you? Too forward. Is that it? No, that's not it. Then what is it? Please sit down and tell me what it is. Uh. I'm... I'm frightened of of everybody. I'm I'm a frightened man. What are you afraid of? Do you know? People. I'm afraid of people. They scare me. And do I scare you? Not so much as before. I gotta get going. John, if you go now, you'll never come back. You won't, will you? I don't know. You won't because you've told me about how you are and you think I'll take advantage. Am I right? Tell me, am I right? I guess. But I won't take advantage, John. Because the way you are, that's the way I am, too. I don't know how she did it, but she did it. I moved into her house. A nice house. A few miles out of town, medium size, with a wide porch that ran around two sides. But it was in a terrible state of disrepair, especially the porch. I wanted to get to work on it right away, but Doreen wouldn't hear of it. Did I say her name was Doreen? Doreen Dawkins. Even after I moved into her house, it was quite a while before I could call her anything but Mrs. Dawkins. Actually, I didn't call her Doreen till after we got married. And even then, not right away. But after a while, I started to feel there was something... Well, something right about me being in that house with her. Being married to her. It was a, a feeling... I don't know how to say it. I can't... I can't find the proper words, but it was a feeling that... That I was... That I was home. Terrible. Don't stand by the window. I like to watch it. Hey, that was a big one. You see that lightning? Lit up the whole sky. Did it come away from the window? You know what, Doreen? What, John? A bolt of lightning was to hit this house. It won't. Well, it could. But it won't. Well, if it did, this whole house would go up like a box of matches. Two, three minutes. Finish. Don't start up again. What? Don't start talking about fixing up the house. Well, why not? I got the time. I got the tools. I got the know-how. Will you leave this house alone? Well, just a few things. It'd be easy. Like the porch now. The floor is sagging. The, the balustrade is falling apart. The steps are broken. I like it the way it is. How can you like it, a woman like you? I like it. Well, there's so much trash collected underneath that porch. Leave it there. Spontaneous combustion. That could happen. I don't want to talk about it. I don't wish to discuss it, understand? Just leave it alone. Leave it the way it is. Good Lord. There's a man standing out there. A man? Yeah, I could see him by that last flash. He's standing by the road. Get away from the window. I could see his face. Just as plain... He's looking right at me. Close the shutters. He was soaking wet. It is no business of yours if he wants to stand out there. We could catch his death. That's his affair. Be a young fella. John, 
If you're thinking of asking him in here... You think I shouldn't? If he wanted to, he'd come to the door and he'd ask. Oh, I don't and know. And if he does, don't you let him in. Don't answer the door. But if he... I don't want anybody in this house to me. Maureen! Oh, what is it now? I saw his face. So clear. He had the look. He wants to come in. He's afraid to ask. So leave him be. He, he's afraid of us. I didn't sleep all night. I kept seeing that man, a oh boy, he looked to be about 20, thin, white-faced, sodden with rain, staring at the house. Not a muscle of his body moved. He just stood and stared. And now, as the sun was coming up, I recognized the look he had. Not that I'd seen it before, but I'd felt it on my own face. Felt it in my own posture. It was the look of separation, isolation. The look of being absolutely alone and helpless to do a thing about it. Doreen left early to deliver a dress she'd made for a lady. And after a while, I went to the door and opened it and looked out. And there he was, sitting down now, leaning against a big oak tree with his face turned up toward the morning sun. Good morning. Good morning. John Masters is my name. What's yours? Simon Kaskia. Well, you were here last night. Mm, mm, yes. I thought I should ask you inside, but my wife said no. Would you like to come inside now? My wife's going out on an errand. Well, would you? Mm, <laughs> yes. Well, then, come on. Come on. What is it? You afraid? I can understand that. I've been afraid in my time. Mm, no more? Not so much as I used to be. But it took little doing and little luck. <laughs> you understand? Huh? Mm, you no. Know. Well, that's all right. I don't understand either. It's just something I said because I felt like it. You ever say anything like that? No. Not even once? Well, I understand that too. Because I was a lot older than you before I said anything just because I felt like it. Now, well, how about coming inside? Have some breakfast, huh? How about it? I wouldn't hurt you. Of course you know that. You're not afraid I'll do you any harm. You, you, you're just afraid, huh? Isn't that how it is? Of course that's how it is. Now, you just give me your hand. Let me pull you up. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> that's it. Now, we're going to walk into the house together. Side by side. See? That's it. <laughs> One foot, mm, mm, other foot. That's it. Yeah. One foot, other foot. Here we go. One foot, other foot. John? John, what are you doing? Come on. One foot, other foot. Don't you dare take that man into my house. One foot, other foot. Don't do it, John. Now stop. Pay no attention, Simon. One foot, other foot. One foot. <laughs> I got him inside, as much for my own sake as for his, because a great feeling of satisfaction spread over me. I had recognized a fellow sufferer. After such a long time, I had recognized my fellow man. Let me quote to you four more lines from the poet cited before the act began. Somewhere there waiteth in this world of ours For one lone soul Another lonely soul Each chasing each Through all the weary hours And meeting strangely At one sudden goal It is really a momentous thing when you take someone into your home, you're inviting him to look at something that is very personal, very much your own. You risk his disapproval even as you silently hope that he'll approve. You're taking a first tentative step towards asking him to know you yourself. 
And he knows that in entering, his risk is quite as great as your own. Now, you just sit there, understand? All right, now. My wife will be here in a minute. She may carry on a bit. Matter of fact, I know she will. I don't know why, but she doesn't want anybody in this house but herself and me. No, no, no. no. Don't get up. Stay right where you are. John. Don't you move. I told you never to let anybody in here. This is my house. Doreen, I want you to go in the kitchen and make a big pot of coffee. Coffee? Our friend here was out in that rain last night, and he hasn't dried out yet. Oh, friend. He could be coming down with a cold. I don't care if he does. Yes, but I care. Now, you do what I said, Doreen. Good, strong coffee. I don't know. Do what... it now. What has come over you? Good, strong coffee. Now. I don't understand this whole thing. Doreen makes very good coffee. You'll feel better after. Now, I want to tell you something. What you're feeling now, I've felt that all my life. Have you? Felt it all your life, I mean? I thought so. Like a stranger, huh? An outsider, huh? Like everybody else is playing some game that looks like a lot of fun, right? Sure. Only you don't know how to play the game, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You'd like to play. You want so much to play, but you don't know how. You don't know the rules. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Sure. I know that feeling well. But but at the same time, you have this other feeling. Very, very small, very faint, but very persistent. It won't go away. That if you could just learn the rules, if somebody would just tell them to you, well, then you'd be able to play the game. And you'd play it very well. You'd, you'd play it as well as anybody. Isn't that it? Don't you have that small feeling... That feeling that won't leave you, won't go away? Mm -mm. Won't go. That's what I thought. (laughs) I'm very grateful to you. You know that? To to me? Yes, you've made me put it into words. I could never do that before. Till you happened along. Mm -mm. I've been here before. You have? Lots of times. Why? If you don't mind telling me. Mm -hmm. The house. What about the house? It isn't much of a house. It it could be a lot better if my wife would let me fix it up, but but she won't. She's got this thing in her head that I mustn't do anything to the house. And me a carpenter, too. What do you do for a living, if I may ask you? I... I beg. You beg? Oh, well, no, that's not good. That's not good at all. You know that, don't you? Of course you do. Who let you grow up like that? Not knowing how to do anything. What were your parents thinking of? <laughs> oh, you were an orphan, huh? Is that it? Well, who brought you up? <laughs> brothers. You had brothers? Yeah. Well, you didn't, huh? Well, then what? Oh, you mean the monks? Yes. Monks. The brothers of the repentance, right? Yeah, sure. They have that monastery on the other side of town. Yes, I, I've passed it lots of times. So that's where you grew up, with the brothers. Mm, huh? mm. Yes. Is that where you got your name? Did they give you that name? Simon Kaskia? Oh, oh, I see. Simon Kaskia. I know that name. Mm, mm, the... A saint. Of course, Simon of Caspian. Mm-hmm. See, now, he was he was a lay brother, wasn't he? Yeah, yes, he was. He never got to be a real monk. He, he was still secular, but yes, they let him work in the monastery, didn't they? Because he was such a good cook. Yeah, isn't, it, isn't that the one? <laughs> the one. Well, now, uh, are you a good cook? Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I... Did they let you spend a lot of time in the kitchen? Mm-hmm. At the monastery? Mm. All. All your time? In the kitchen? Mm. All my time. And you learn how to cook, huh? Mm, m- m- some. Here's the coffee you asked for. Doreen? Our friend here's a cook. He can cook. What do you know about that? Well, he could hire himself out as a... I bought some toast, too. Oh, that's nice. I thought he might be hungry. Of course he's hungry. Why didn't I think of that? 
Pour the coffee, will you, Doreen? I brought two cups. Well, why didn't you bring three? We could all have some coffee together. Oh, that's cream and sugar. Good. Get another cup, Doreen. We'll all... I'm going upstairs. Simon was telling me about himself. When he's finished, he's got to get up and go. Now, Doreen... Tell him that. Make it perfectly clear. Pay no attention. She doesn't really mean that, or she wouldn't have made you the toast. Go on, now. Eat up. Help yourself to cream and sugar. Now, look here. Doreen's brought you some strawberry jam. See? I told you she liked you. She'd never have done that. It's just this house that she's so particular about. Mm -hmm. A house? You know, something about this house. She, she wants it left just like it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, so much could be done to it. You've noticed the porch. It's going to fall down one of these days. But she won't let me touch it. Won't let me near it. One of these days. And the trash that's collected underneath it. She won't even let me clear it out. It's dangerous, all that rubbish. Must have collected for years. How's the coffee? Mmm. It's good. Oh, and the toast? Good jam, isn't it? Mmm. Good. Simon, do you mind if I ask you something personal? No. Well, you, uh, you have a peculiar way of speaking. Uh, uh, you know that, don't you? Yes. It's kind of a, a hesitation. You, you say your words all right, but every so often this... This... Uh, you know you do that, don't you? Yeah, I know. It's not a terrible thing to do. I, I, I don't mean that. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Only the way you do it, it's... sometimes one, sometimes the other, sometimes both, sometimes neither one, but, well, it's different. It's, uh... oh, well, never mind. It's not important. It's just that well, I, I'm interested in you. You understand, don't you? I'm not crying. I understand. And now, that time you didn't do it at all. Oh, well, forget it. Because I want to get on to something more important. What are we going to do with you? Mm -hmm. What? I I'm not going to turn you out and let you go back to begging again. I won't do that. I want you to stay on here for a while. We've got the room. You can do something to earn your keep. If you feel like it. Well, you could help out Doreen in the kitchen. If you want to. I'm no good in the kitchen, that's for sure. John? Uh-oh, that's my wife. John, is that man still there? Pay no attention. John, I want you to come upstairs. Mm -hmm. you, you better... You come up here, John. I want to talk with you. You better go. John? I'll come right back. Everything will be all right. You see. I'll talk to her, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. But you stay right there, you hear? I'll have a talk with her. And I'll come straight back. It was so important to me. I wasn't going to set this boy adrift to go wandering about the world, afraid to open his mouth to anyone, afraid to wake up to the morning, afraid to close his eyes at night, afraid to feel, afraid to touch, afraid to know, afraid to live. Oh, I'd had too many years of that myself. I wasn't about to let him do the same. For him, it had to be different. I opened the bedroom door. And Doreen was lying on the bed, staring at the ceiling. Is he gone? Nope. He finished eating, didn't he? Yes. Then get him out of here. No. I want him to stay here with us for a little while. No, I won't have it. Please, Doreen. You brought him in, you fed him, I fed him. What more did he want? It's not what he wants, it's what I want. I want him to stay on with us till he gets to know us. I don't want him to get to know us. I don't want him in this house. I want him out. Doreen, don't you remember how I was before you asked me in? Asked me to sit down and talk? Asked me to marry you? What's that got to do with him being here? Everything. Don't you see? He's the way I was. I was that way when I was his age. I was that way all my life till you changed me. I don't know how. I don't know what you did. 
I don't even know if you did anything. I don't know if I did anything. Maybe it was just luck, just pure dumb luck that you asked me and that I said, okay, all right. Maybe, maybe God just took notice that I needed something, someone to pay attention to me. And you needed someone to pay attention to you. So he moved you to speak, and he moved me to answer. This is different. Just get him out of the house. What's so almighty precious about this house? It's my house. What is it, sanctified or something? Yes. Yes, it's sanctified. It's holy. You oughtn't to say such things, Dory. It is. It is. It's not about a house. It's sacrilegious. A house is just boards and nails and plaster. Not this house. Any house. Not this one. A house is for people to come into, not to shut them out of. Not my house. Why not your house? Why is your house so different from other people's houses? What makes it so special, so spectacular, so all fired sacred that nobody can set a foot in it? You tell me, Doreen. Well, I swear I'll walk out of this precious house of yours. I'll leave you to it. You can live in it by yourself. You wouldn't do that. I would. You can count on it. John? Now, you tell me. What does this house mean to you? Why do you hang on to it like it was all you had? Every time I want to fix something or change something, make it better, why do you yell out like I was going to do something to hurt you? You tell me, Doreen. I want to know. My, my daughter was born in this house. Your daughter? My daughter lived in this house. My daughter died in this house. Her daughter. I'd never known she'd had a daughter. Now a whole field of grief spread across her face. A grief such as I had never known and would likely never know. I took her in my arms and I held her. Held and rocked her back and forth. And she cried and cried without tears, without sound. I forgot entirely the young man who was waiting for me in the parlor downstairs. May I quote to you another poet? An American poet named Ralph Waldo Emerson, who lived in the century before ours. Here is what he wrote in 1841. A sublime hope cheers the faithful heart that elsewhere souls are now acting, enduring, and daring, which can love us and which we can love. I'll be back with Act Three shortly. Again, let me quote to you from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who thought a great deal and wrote at some length on the subject of friendship. A friend may well be reckoned the masterpiece of nature. And this, happy is the house that shelters a friend. Now, let's get back to the final act of The Wandering Wind. I sat and held her for a long time. This woman, who had so strangely, almost accidentally, become my wife, and thereby made all her griefs, as well as her joys, my griefs and joys. Doreen, honey, don't you want to tell me about it? I don't know if I can. You could try. I suppose. Sure you could. You had a daughter. What was her name? Tell me that. Mary. Mary. That's a pretty name. Oh, she was a pretty little girl. I loved her so much. Of course you did. After her father died, we just had each other, nobody else. Mm Mm-hmm. And we... We protected each other, took care of each other. 
Do you know what I mean? I think I do. <laughs> Not that either of us knew anything. I certainly didn't. Oh, you did your best? My best. My best wasn't good enough. My best was nothing at all. Uh, no. Doing my best. I killed her doing my best. Honey, don't go. And you don't expect me to believe that. But it's true. It's true. Uh, you just tell me all about it. I love you, you know. What? I love you. You never said that before. Well, I should have. Well, I'm saying it now. I love you, John. You've never said that before. I should have. <laughs> we never got around to it, did we? Stupid. Oh, I'm not stupid. Just scared. Yes. I'm scared. Well, now. Now that we understand each other, tell me about your daughter. Mary was... Well, she wasn't perfect. Maybe I was too strict with her. When she was 13, she started, you know, seeing boys. She had lots of boyfriends. She was so pretty. I was very proud and pleased. She'd tell me all about them, and I'd listen and remember how it was when I was her age. So exciting. So exciting. Sure. But confusing, too. Oh, sure. I should have told her more. I should have told her. Told her what? About boys. About men, all that. Only I didn't really know anything. I didn't know what to say. I, I would have said it. You see, nobody ever told me anything. I just got married when I was 16, and I had Mary a year later, and then my husband died, so I didn't know anything about other things. Mm -hmm. One day, she was just 14. She came home, and she told me she was pregnant. Oh, Doreen. Yes, pregnant. 14 years old and pregnant. All right. So what did you do? I was so scared. So scared somebody would find out. You know how people are. They wouldn't give me any work. They'd shun my daughter. They'd call her names. They'd snicker behind her back. I mean, you know they would, John. Well, some of them, maybe. Most and of them. And how was I going to support her? How was I going to raise the baby? Who was going to pay for all that? So what'd you do? I... I shut her up. In this house. I never let her go out. I told everybody that asked about her that she'd got a job in the city. I said she wrote me all the time and called me up, and she was fine. I kept her in the house till the baby was born. Well, what did you think you were going to do after that? I don't know. I thought I'll think of something. Okay. Go on. The baby started to be born. Here? Here in this house? Well, I couldn't take her to a hospital, could I? I knew how it was to give birth. I'd done that myself. I knew about that. And I stood right next to her and I told her what to do. And it wasn't too bad. The baby got born right there on the kitchen table. And we were both so happy, both of us. And the baby was healthy and beautiful. And he seemed happy, too. He did. He really did. Well, then what? Well, I thought in a few days we'll start to make plans. We'll go away, the three of us, change our names maybe, do something. But then... Then? She started to not feel so good. Her forehead was hot, hot to the touch. She was burning up with some kind of fever. And after a while, I couldn't talk to her because she wasn't making any sense. And we couldn't make any plans because nothing she said made any sense anymore. And after a few days, she died. 
she died. Oh, Dory. My daughter died. Oh, honey. And I took the baby one night. And I put him in a basket. All wrapped up warm. And I left him on somebody's porch. That's what I did. That's what I did. It's all right now. It's all right. You just rest, honey. It's all right. What was that? What? I heard a door slam downstairs. That man. Oh, good Lord. I forgot all about him. He's gone. I told him to wait for me, and then I forgot him. It's good he's gone. No. I, I... don't want him in my house. Yes, but I told him... That... No, don't go. Well, if this is important to me, Doreen. I'll explain it to you later if I can. But I have to tell you something, John. Later. Later. I'll be back. I raced down the stairs. I left Doreen lying on the bed, exhausted but calm and peaceful. I don't know what was driving me. Just this tormenting feeling that nobody, nobody should be left to wander this perilous world alone. I couldn't save all of them. I couldn't catch up with all of them. But this one man, there was a chance. A chance for me. A chance for him. And I could not bear to miss that chance. Simon? You hear? Simon? Simon Kaskia? Young man? You hear? It's me. I'm back. I said to wait for me. Where are you? Simon? Simon? Did you leave the house? Did you think I wasn't coming back? Simon! Simon Kaskia, it's me! I'm here! John? Please, John. He's not in the house, Doreen. I, I, I looked at all the rooms. Well, then he's left. Well, he can't have gone far. I'm going to get my coat and go after him. You don't even know which direction he went well, in. Probably towards town. That'd be logical, wouldn't it? He begs for a living. Did I tell you that? That's a disgrace. A young fellow like that having to beg on the streets. All he needs is somebody to straighten him around, feed him up. Not just food. That part's easy. I mean, feed up his confidence. Let him know somebody's by his side. Like me, being here. Doreen... I'd never have moved in here if you hadn't asked me. You know that. I know, but... Then you know why I have to go find that young man. Only if you do find him, John. Don't bring him back to this house. Why not? Because... My daughter is buried here. Too much had happened. I'd been told too much, learned too much, felt too much. I couldn't listen anymore. I simply had to follow through with what I'd started out to do. I put my coat on and I went outside. Down the rickety stairs. And Doreen followed me, but I kept going down to the road, looking in one direction, then the other, for some side of Simon Kaskia, the young man for whom I felt so responsible. <coughs> Doreen! <coughs> Doreen! Doreen! I told you! I told you! What's the matter? What is it? Look. Look there under the porch. Look. There's nothing. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's nothing, Doreen. Just some trash. Somebody's been clearing out some trash. That's he all. did it. He did it. Of course Simon did it. I talked to him about all that rubbish under the porch. Look, it's, it's all right. He probably did it as a favor before he took off. He thought we'd like it. It was to show his appreciation. He was trying to do a nice thing. Put it back. Put what back? Put it back. Under the porch. All right, now. All right. I'll put it back if you want me to. But why, Doreen? Just tell me why. Because under that porch is my daughter's grave. She's buried there. <laughs> didn't put the rubbish back. I couldn't after what she said. I crawled under the porch myself, through all the debris that had collected there, and I found a two-by-four about three feet long stuck into the ground and another piece of wood nailed to it crosswise. And on the cross piece, a name had been scratched, first with a nail and then filled in with ink. Mary Dawkins. But that's not all. The cross with the name scratched on it 
stood at one end of a bed made of stones. Stones driven into the ground. Enough of them to cover the casket of a young girl of 14. And on that bed of stones was Simon Kaskia, fast asleep. Simon? I'm here, Simon. He's here, Doreen. Simon's here. Simon? Wake up, Simon. Wake up. I'm here. <laughs> Wake up now. It's all right. I'm here. Mama. Papa. We're here. Right here. One of these days, Doreen and I are going to go and see the Brothers of the Repentance. They must have some record of a baby boy they took to live with them some 18 years ago. Maybe it'll turn out that Simon was that baby. That Simon is Doreen's grandchild. It'll be very nice if that turns out to be the case. But it doesn't matter too much. The thing is, He's living with us. And he doesn't stammer anymore. He doesn't try so hard to say, Mama and Papa. He's come home. Do you believe such things that a grown man can, without knowing what he is doing, search the world for his parents? I do. And I believe that in some hidden corner of his heart, everyone does it. Somewhere in that corner, a tiny voice is calling, Mama. Papa. Yes, I believe that. And I believe that the little voice keeps on crying his whole life through. I'll be back shortly. of us start out calling our parents mama and papa. Then about age five, that seems babyish, lacking in dignity or respect or something. Some people even graduate later on to sir and ma'am or call their parents by their first names. I've heard of people who do that. But the sweetest words, the words of love and dependency will always be mama and papa. Our cast included Terry Keene, John Beale, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Until next time, pleasant dreams.